So the first match we obviously have was against Echo, going into Halls of Atonement. Our Halls of Atonement was very different from a lot of other people, primarily because we played with a Paladin, and we didn't play Night Elf, right? Um, because we made our pulls around the Paladin. As you can see, the first pulls are very, very different as to where we pull everything in the middle towards the right side for the giant, right? You need to kill the three giants before you can activate the first boss. And having the line of spot, like line of sight spot you can have over here is really, really good for pulling everything together. So what we do is that we pulled a lot of mobs in the middle and brought all of them in here on top of the Halkias with Lust. And we blast this pull basically, right? Which is a really, really big pull with a lot of mobs. The reason for us being, like, being able to do this is due to the Paladin's, um, what's it called? Covenant ability, which is the Hollow, right? Which does insane damage and healing. On top of that, we committed our Lust and our Racial. Our Racial being the Dwarf Racial, specifically the Dark Iron Dwarf Racial, which allows us to remove curses. So when we got the curses, that's uninterruptible due to the affix being, uh, what's that called? Inspiring. Uh, we could just take it off with our racial, right? And after we've done that with our racials, we had our mage to remove the remaining. So basically, like, this pool was played around us being dwarves and our healer being a paladin, right? Like, you have to play around your paladin healer if you play with a paladin healer who is Venthyr, because you want to play around in his hollow or the immense amount of damage you can do. As you can see, Jeeth doing 15k on the first pool, which is insane for a healer, right? So we do this first pull, uh, obviously we can skip pride, shift like uh, skip prides because we're not playing Night Elf, we don't have Shadow Mode to kill, take them off. One of our reasons for doing this was actually that we didn't know that Manifestation of a Pride was skippable until 3 days in and our Horse of Atonement practice was already gone and we were on our third map. <laughs> That's when we realized that we actually could skip them with Melt, so it was too late. But there's really not a lot to do about it. We still managed to do a really good timer with the comp that we had for Halls, and we're very happy about it, as you'll see. Like, it's very, very close. And what we do here is that we bring all the remaining mobs in the middle into the Hellkias and do another big pause. Halls of the Showman is a dungeon that allows for a lot of big pause, and you can basically blast a lot of mobs, right? As to where you can see a lot of other people played here in the middle, uh, again, due to them. Just playing it differently because our opener our first pull is very different in comparison to a lot of other teams but we end up killing the second giant as our second pull as to where echo goes on the left side first then we go to the right side right just due to the comps that like the difference that we had in comps <laughs> so they kill off this one let's see have the dual screen if we can find us again so we're here, we kill off the manifestation, we kill off like the pool that we just saw before and we get a pride from that. Again, we cannot skip the pride, we have to kill it from from not being able to skip it with Shadow Mode. So we kill it off and even initially we were like, okay, if we end up playing Night Elf now that we know this trick, would we actually skip all of the prides? And we agree we skip most of the prides, however, this pride here that we just killed, which would be the second pride, a 40% pride, We'd have to kill for our third pull, which was a really, really big pull that already propped Fem's cheetah, which is all of the downstairs with the uh, golem, right? In the corner, which is a lot of mobs. A lot, a lot of mobs. It's basically almost as big as the first one. And what allows us to kill that so easily and so clean is due to the right buff, right? So we don't get a lot of bolts going out from the casters, we don't get a lot of curses going out from the casters because everything dies so quick. So that was our pull, uh, and even if we could have skipped prides, we wouldn't have skipped that pride. We would kill that pride, so we were able to pull that pull off. You can also see Echo doing the same, doing another big pull, uh, having to have pride for it, right? What we do here is, as soon as we spawned a pride, we pulled in the closest gargoyle, uh, which people very often use for the boss. However, we have a trick later that allows us not to use this gargoyle and basically get a gargoyle to kill this prideful very, very quickly, right? So as you can see, we get in the gargoyle and the prideful just dies a lot quicker. We don't have to use any cooldowns. Uh, we don't have to use any defensives. So the gargoyle basically solos the pride. Petka goes out. He sheeps the patrol. So it's in a good position for Fem to start stacking them up when we're done with the pride. 
so that's what's happening, right? So, Pride Fork goes down slowly. We don't really take a lot of damage because the damage reduction and the Pride doesn't gain in a lot of stacks, like a lot of stacks, so therefore we don't take a lot of damage, right? It's basically a win-win getting that Pride really quick. And again, this would have been the Pride that we wouldn't have skipped because the pull that we're about to do is really big, right? Basically pulling a lot of mobs on top of the boss and we need as much damage as possible to be able to kill all of the mobs ASAP before the casts and like curses starts killing us, right? So as where you can see, Echo brings in some other mobs from the right side. We play it from an entirely different angle and we play all of the mobs on the left side, uh, which is a lot of mobs, a lot of casters, a lot more casters uh, and dark blades, I'm pretty sure. But for some reason, again, there's no double screen. Let's scroll a little bit so we can find ourselves again. So yeah, sadly, this pool for some reason is not being shown because there's no double screen from us. Uh, but basically what we do is that we have the entire outer ring of the left side of Hordes of Atonement pulled in, where there's the patrolling pack, there is two caster packs, and then the pack in front of the boss. And we bring all of those in on top of the boss, and we basically killed that on top of the boss. And we needed that pride for to be able to do that, of course, right? Because that's a lot of mobs. <laughs> you, you won't really be able to live it without it. So basically, it's where we commit all our cooldowns. Obviously, we won't have lost. But everything except for lost, we blast there. And uh, they die in the meantime, right? You can see there's two of the hound masters staying alive. It don't really matter too much. They'll die over time from our passive cleave. We grip them in on cooldown, etc, etc. So they will die with time. They don't do anything to Fem. They don't give him necrotic stacks. They don't melee. Uh, so that's totally fine. Their shoots aren't that bad to deal with. So they'll die over time. What you see here now is that G, the mid fight, after a little while after our first gargoyle disappears, the first gargoyle that stands under the podium or whatever you'd call it, we bring that in a pool, of course, right? And then normally what people would do is that over here there's another gargoyle, right? Which is pretty close you'll be able to get that navigate the boss over there and get that gargoyle but as mentioned we use that to kill that pride that echo did and as you can see they skipped that so you have jeeth going up with bubble which normally fears you and he pulls the gargoyle and he gets gripped back by curry so he doesn't like the bubble is up for the entire duration and he gets back in safely and the gargoyle starts coming over the gargoyles in horse of atonement are insanely overpowered they give you a 20 percent damage reduction and the damage output that the gargoyles gives are really good so you can see the gargoyle coming in, boss being 25% HP, and we get the mind controlled gargoyle and it starts doing a lot of damage to the boss. So here, we are in a pretty good state, like, mobs are dying as they should. You see again, the Hound's Master is just slowly dying to cleave, it doesn't do anything. We have Petco pull some of the small mobs over here. The reason for pulling these over here is to prack, rock the pride right after boss, so we can kill it. Originally, if we were to play Night Elf, we would have skipped this pride. It's pr not that important to kill. But obviously, we're unable to due to not playing the right race, if you will call it the right race. So we can't do that, right? As to where you can see Echo, they just sprint off and they'll uh, melt it off, right? So we kill off these and they'll spawn the pride that we'll have to kill because we're not playing Night Elves, which is. It is what it is, right? That's what we committed for. We had the Paladin, so we get a lot of damage. But we miss a lot of time by having to kill every single pride, right? So we kill this pride, and instead of having to use our melt, of course, we'll use an invis post to cross all of the mobs. Because killing all of those mobs and waiting for them to be patrolling, right, is just a waste of time. Uh, so it's way easier just to commit a pot and skip everything. Obviously, a pot is still really good, and it saves you a lot of damage. Or it gives you a lot of damage, especially in burst phases. But you save a lot more time by using that stuff pot than having to like use a pot for damage, right? However, the melt would have been really good here. Melt is really good here, without a doubt. Obviously, if you had a rogue, you could shroud as well, which is very common as well. The pride buff, however, is pretty neat for this boss. This boss is probably the, well, is the most difficult boss in the dungeon. And he slaps. Like, if he lives for too long, Echelon actually starts becoming a very, very scary boss, right? So having the pride fall there wasn't too bad. Obviously, you still lose a lot of time having to kill the pride, and you don't have the entirety of the uptime. But it still managed to work out, right? Let's scroll a bit. Not a lot to talk about Echelon. Basically what we do is that both Petco and Jeeth would pure single target the boss. Uh, one of the reasons actually that we played Shadow Priest and a lot of people don't know, uh, people were very confused with our choice for Shadow Priest. But Shadow Priest single target damage is very very powerful, right? So Jeeth played a full single target build 
we got the PI for Petco and AoE pulls, and he basically just blasted the bosses. Like, bosses dies. His uh, single target damage is really good. He doesn't do any AoE, and he just kills the bosses. That's what we brought it in for. That, the PI, the single target damage, and the grip from the first boss that you saw, so we could get the Gargoyle, right? Was our plan. And it was too late in. Like, we tried Monk. We tried a few other classes, but the Shadow Priest single target damage was just so neat for our comp. And having that PI for our mage in the damage that mattered and when I have army, etc, etc, was really good for our boss damage. And it being uh, like the dungeon it is, having some budget damage, like in Tyrannical, is really neat, right? But not a lot to say about Echelon. Just skip him a bit. You can see the damage here, even though pe like uh, Echo starts way earlier on the boss than us, we're about to catch up. Right? Like our boss damage is very, very good uh, because of Curry. Like Curry is blasting 7k single target damage on the boss, which is really good, right? So obviously Echo finishes a bit earlier than us. And just like them, we'll go in to the next room and we're pulling every single mob from entering the room up to the boss, right? So we get the Hound Masters, we get the Gargons. However, what we do is that we CC one of the Gargons who had Inspiring. Inspiring being the affix that allows you to not stun and or interrupt. And then we would play it later, right? So we go in, we CC it, and then we bring all of them up. So we could bring one Gargoyle. We have Curry Grip Me, as my class is very slow, and it was needed so I could actually get into the room and not die. Uh, obviously, if we played a Monk, that would have worked as well, which would have been our other option with, uh, what's that called? Yeah, the speed. I can't remember what's called. So basically this boss was actually one of the easier pulls, even though it looks very, very scary. Like all of those mobs don't do a lot because they die very quickly and they're not that scary for tank. They all get stacked up easily. You have a bat uh, making it very, very easy to kill off. You also have all your cooldowns because you've been on a boss and it dies. So all the cooldowns lines up for as soon as you get into this room, right? So after a minute, what we did, as mentioned, is that we had one of the inspiring mobs outside uh, CC. So we would wait for it to come in. And on this boss, if you have the range for it, people can grab the second bat in the back of the room. So you can have one on pull, and then one later. So you can see when the mobs comes in, the last mob, which is the inspired Gargon, we will also be getting in a bat, which will kill off the Gargon and the boss. The bats basically just deals tremendous amount of single target damage, and getting them both in is very, very important. You can also see Echo doing it here. They have their second bat. We just got our second bat in. Now there's a Gargon on top as well that's just going to die passively from Cleave. Uh, and the reason for us not taking in the Gargon was just there was not really a reason to bring it in and it made it a little bit more safe. You wouldn't do more damage, you wouldn't do less damage. Just more safe. It's safer for the tank. Uh, you can interrupt the sins from the Collector who also has Inspiring. Uh, but however, if you had two Inspiring, obviously the Inspiring would overlap and you wouldn't be able to interrupt each other, right? However, the way we did it, we were allowed to interrupt the sins making it a little bit more easy there was one less gargon so if the other mobs live for too long and they casted the loyal beasts then them would take like really big damage so it's basically just a safety choice it doesn't lose time and or damage on it then of course we have inquisitor which uh echoes on now we are just behind five percent boss damage it's gonna scroll slightly so we can get to it not a lot to say on the boss of five percent it just dies from damage. So what we did here was that Petco would commit combust and I would commit army to the Inquisitor and everyone else saved their cooldown so they would be able to kill the boss, right? So we would have Hollow and we would have Curry's cooldowns, with PI, I think. Now nah, we use PI here, but Curry had cooldowns, Jeeth has his cooldowns, Petco would have combust back, right? So it was basically just DK and Mage doing a lot of damage to this Inquisitor. So basically, the Inquisitor needs to die before it starts casting the heal, right? Where it steals HP from its mobs. And uh, you don't want to commit everything to it. Like, we don't lust, for example. We want to save loss for the boss to be able to kill the boss earlier. As long as you have damage enough to kill him, with personal cooldowns, being able to save the loss for the boss was a better choice. As again, this mob will spawn a Prideful. And Prideful, we are unable to skip. So what we do is that we bring in the Prideful on the boss, and we'll lust it, kill it onto the cleave onto the boss, so we don't lose as much time, right? So you can see, waiting for the Prideful to come out, just dealing with the small echoes, whatnot, whatnot, and then we'll bring it in, and we kill the Prideful on top of the boss. 
Obviously, you st still lose a lot of damage from having to cleaving one mob down and focusing Prideful before you go on to Chamber Lane. But the time that we lose isn't too bad, especially with Lost Up, the mob, uh, like the boss dies pretty quickly, right? Like the Prideful will die, get some free cleave, even though it's not a lot, it's still free cleave onto Chamber Lane, right? Because you've lost 4% HP, I think he loses 5 before the Prideful is dead from free cleave. We don't lose anything as mentioned, so might as well. It was even more, it was like 6%. And now we have, yeah, the Jeeth have cooldown, she starts pumping now, I think. And then it's basically just a single target race, right? And this is again where the Shadow Priest comes in and deal a lot of single target damage, which is super helpful for our come. As DK in an AoE build isn't the best single target class. Obviously Mage is good wherever, <laughs> at whatever, an AoE single target is pretty good. And we'll have the Paladin, our healer, doing a lot of damage as well. So this was basically just the race to who could kill the burst boss first, right? Where Echo will end up winning by a few seconds. Uh, our shortcomings definitely being that we didn't play Night Off, and that should have been something that we should have looked at and changed. But due to the time that you only have <clears throat> in between your time trials and practicing the maps, we were unable to commit the time to be able to practicing a new race and a new route, finding new routes, etc., etc. Right. So with what we had, we were definitely very, very happy with our outcome. We were, I think it was eight seconds behind Echo in Horse of Atonement, uh with a sub bar comp being that we play without melt right so it's definitely pretty good play we didn't have any deaths we did the route as good as we could it couldn't have been any faster basically uh so we were pretty happy with that output right so that was the first map Horse of Atonement, which in my opinion was a really like it was a really good match right like to watch and watch them replay Echo played really well. Good job for them. Like, good job on them. Like, they, they played it really good. And sadly, we lost the first game, right? And, um, again, due to the time commitment that you have on TR and in between cops, our next map was Plaguefall. And Plaguefall was not a map that we had to play in time trial. And it was a map that we didn't, in, like, think we were going to play too much. So what we'd have to do, and what every other team would have to do, is that there's some maps you wouldn't have time to practice, right? Plaguefall being one of ours. We didn't have time to practice Plaguefall. So we basically just went for a quickly, quick no lever comp. As you probably saw if you watched the game, we didn't really know what we were doing. <laughs> and it was like, oh yeah, let's uh, let's go into Plaguefall, yeah. Let's just quickly make a weekly no lever round. <laughs> Which we did, right? We, we had no idea. We... Made some small pool, we just chilled for a bit. And obviously, you don't really get a winning game out of a weekly no lever. It's not a lot to say. We didn't think a lot about our routes. It was mostly just as, oh, let's just keep pulling. Which came to bite us, right? Because we actually died a lot. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we basically just do a weekly no lever play fall. There's not a lot to say about our routing, etc., etc. Our classes choices, not a lot to say either. It was more of a, let's just play what we played in horse. Kuru would go a monk, he won't play the priest here. Um, and then we just went through it, right? And uh, obviously, we didn't get that far into the dungeon in comparison to our good friend Zeka. As to where we still weren't the first boss, that we're approaching second boss. Etc, etc, right? So let's see. Not a lot to say. We didn't do anything fancy. We just looked at the dungeon a bit chilled honestly just did some weekly no lever we didn't want to stop right like that's on sportsmanship but even though we didn't have a route we still wanted to play so we just did some weekly stuff no reason to not keep going always want to keep going right um and by the time that echo reaches the last room i think we are just about to kill the second boss uh, or when they kill the last boss we kill the second boss right so you can see there in last boss we are on second boss there's not a lot to say. We basically just got absolutely stomped on in Plague 4, but we expected so. We didn't have the time to practice this map because we had to practice other maps that we were going to play in the lower brackets because we expected to reach the lower brackets. Um, to be very fair. However, we wanted to put up a really good show in Horse of Atonement, which I think we did. I think our Horse of Atonement show was really good. We brought something new to the table. We brought a Paladin. We brought a Shadow Priest, and we competed really well and almost... <laughs> we're able to take it actually right with the come that we played so that was the first game against uh echo that we lost two to zero right so the next game which was in lower bracket we come against 
Golden Guardians, right? Golden Guardians, of course, being what used to be Method NA with uh, Jadar, Shaqib, Yoda, Lighty. Uh, so yeah, let's mute that. So first map was the other side. The other side, I would say, is definitely one of the most tough dungeons to look at from a MDI perspective, right? Basically, what I mean by that is that it's very linear. You have to go down these routes. You have to do this and that. But however, what we did, uh, which um, I'll explain and I'll give a reasoning for what could be used in the future as well, if it wasn't bolstering, which was the affix here, right? It was bolstering, breaking tyrannical, right? So what we do is that we skip the first set of mobs for pride timers. We want the pride at the right time. You can see we slow fall immediately when the dungeon starts. We jump over and we skip the entirety of the first platform. Um, so we have me jumping off, getting my pet spawn. So my pet doesn't pull anything and it doesn't go awkward when I jump off the edges because they can just disappear. So we play the good old first pack here. Nothing too special. We use our pot here um, because we won't be potting the first boss. So this. It's just basically a lot of cooldowns. Uh, let me put some quality on here and zoom in, yeah? That's where you can see Golden Guardians killing the first pull, which is a very free pull. It's very free count. You do it as well in your Mythic Plus, right? Etc, etc. Uh, we kill off this second pack, which they're approaching now. So we can think of this as we are further ahead in Thai, like in, like in the dungeon, even though our count is lower. Or just about the same due to walking distance we are at the position already outside of the first door pretty early which allows us to get the enraged spirit in very early and we can deal with this enraged spirit now again due to pride timers we want to kill this enraged spirit for pride timers you can't skip the enraged spirits because when you do mugansala you will you will jump in between where the spirits patrol right so you cannot dodge the spirits from what we know they might find a strat being able to spawn them at some time in the future but as it stands right now they're unskippable and you'll have to kill them so we deal with it now we use a little bit of monk cooldowns not too much it's more of a he used cooldown at the first pull and he takes it for the gogan solar no that's the boss in eternal palace the the squid but here we have the first pull uh as soon as you come into the first room there was a lot of different ways that people dealt with it um, I think we would pull bigger if it wasn't for bolstering, but what we did is that we killed these first two small leaves, which are the Devoted. You don't want to let the Devoted cast go through, so get rid of the Devoted, and then we take it from there. We fear the first card of the Devoted, and there shouldn't be a second. As you can see, they die, and when they're dead, we bring our mobs. So we have Jeeth pushing it in closer to the um, urn, which is right over here, and we have ob obviously our set interrupts for heal, etc, etc, right? So all of us has like a heal interrupt that's very important to take and then we let the hexes go through and we dispel those and the damage, the lightning discharge, you just go out with it basically, you can see I go out here and then you basically start pumping, right? And all of these devoteds, there's usually three devoted right here, Fen will grip in on top and everything will be standing together on top of the urn, right? So we can AoE blast this down. So after everything is stacked, it's pretty straightforward, right? You basically just kill off the mobs, get the interrupts you assigned which is the heal ones primarily right so we kill them off the small ones don't bolster that's also important to mention right the devoted do not bolster which is really good for you know pulling these kind of pulls right like if there's some mobs with immensely low hp that just doesn't give bolster the devoted being one of them so this pull just dies off ever so slowly they still do a lot of damage to fem obviously death walkers is basically the king's rest mob equivalent of the bleed effect mobs the berserkers i think they were called in king's rest so you just get rid of those they smack the tank so we have the pride fall and as you can see we're now playing nelfs we don't have a paladin we're all playing night elves so we, which allows us to skip then we'll jump away we all nelf and we go for the next ball uh one of the reasons that we have the pride spawn over there was that we also tried to have the spawn pride from this pack with another route but with the pull that we made it just was just so much easier and simpler and more consistent having the pride proc from the previous pull than the pull like the last pull regards to the pride spawners therefore that was like our reasoning behind the route getting our first pride pool to spawn in a good position making it super easy to skip um and then we would have our shadow mob back by the end of the first boss right like when first boss is dead we will be able to shadow mob past it again when we walk out so we kill off these mobs nothing too special just some free interrupts on the hexer kill everything off 
pretty easy mobs to pack in general to deal with. Um, nothing really interesting there. And then Hakar. Hakar was a wall that we were stuck at for a long time. He's probably the hardest boss in entirety of Shadowlands, in my opinion, because of his DPS checks being insanely overtuned. So what we have to do is that we hold off all of our cooldowns. Basically, we figured out that Hakar doesn't spawn a lot of his pets until like reaching a certain HP threshold. What we do is that we would go in and we would use 45 one minute cooldown CDs on pull. And then after that time was gone, when I got my unholy blight back, basically, I would call for lost and we would play around that lost with my army and kill the boss in that time room. Because if he gets a third set of blood barrier, I think it is, no, it's fourth set of blood barrier, you're basically wiped. You cannot have that last blood barrier spawn like it's gonna make it way more difficult so if you don't know how a car works it's basically the corrupted blood which basically circle don't stand in that and whenever he casts his blood barrier oh wait what are you doing depending on how much damage you take the bigger his shield will be so if you have damage reduction etc etc it will make the shield smaller however it also works on his own minions and he deals damage to his own bats or whatever right so that's why you want to deal with those bats you don't want to have a lot of those bats and you can see a call for lost get army bosses at 66 percent before we start pumping the boss right that will allow us to not get a lot of pets the barriers is going to be very easy to deal with etc etc right you see we only have two sons of a car we had 40 percent our cooldowns are running and the boss is going to take a lot of damage sons of a car will die passively from cleave so we like right before he casts us the block barrier, he won't hit his pets, therefore making the shield smaller, right? That's the idea of it. You don't want to have a, a little of his pets up when he casts this block barrier. So he doesn't get a good shield. Nothing else to say. We just have the goal of killing the boss before the next barrier, I think. Yeah, so basically it's a DPS race. And that was the reasoning due to the delayed loss, right? We don't want that barrier, right? So we have Curry killing him off touch of death to be sure and then we just chill and that is basically just the walk back through we get past the what's that called prideful again we have our shadow melt ready and that was the idea of having that prideful there the boss lasts just below two minutes so you want to be able to have melt as soon as you get out of that door right you want to be able to melt as soon as you see that pride again because you don't want to take the ticket damage you don't want to get hit by the what's it called the prideful stun you see we melt off and will double jump. What will happen here is that Petco will give me slow fall due to my class being very fast smile. And you can see that we just go to the next pack basically. What will happen is that I'll jump from one side to another just because any time matters basically. But you can't really see that due from the angle. You can see me coming in there. Basically, it's just a time investment, right? We figure you can save like a few, a little while. Like any time matters in the MDI, right? And you can really abuse slow fall as you saw in the start and there to save a little bit of time. So what we'll do is that we'll bring the risen mobs down to low HP due to bolster, right? Obviously, if you get them on top of the bone soldiers and the raptors immediately, they will omega bolster, right? So what we'll do is that we get them to 40% and then we bring them in on top of the other pack. And then we deal a little bit of damage to the bone soldier who has more HP than the raptors. And then focusing the bone soldiers and the two big ones and then the raptors will die very quickly from passive cleave as they basically have no HP. Making them very annoying to deal with in bolster if you don't play carefully. So we get those mobs in. And then we just kill it off. Try to kill it off as fast as, well, as fast as possible of course. But at the same time so we don't have to deal with bolster. A good thing to mention though with Risen Warlords is that sh they can get a lot of bolsters after they reach 1% and have their enrage e effect off. And then basically when the enrage effect disappears they will just die because if they have one one hp and they got a bolster stack and that won't increase their hp they will still be dead basically when the enrage disappears so you can see it has zero hp the enrage disappears and it dies basically right so it doesn't matter if they get bolsters if they're enraged as long as they have no hp so in here which is the mechagon zone was the zone that we struck with for the longest time the mobs are super annoying uh the pools are very hard to pull off you need cooldowns you need to deal with them so what we figured is that okay we want to skip this prime in this area because it's a waste of time and it will spawn at annoying timers no matter what so if you kill these four mobs first it will spawn from that prideful don't want to deal with that and right after that 
a big pull comes where you really need to like giga blast the uh, lubricators or you'll have to like you'll die right you need to do really big damage so what we do is that we in this pot past everything Fem sadly uh, uses his pot somewhere else, so he has to die. So we will go in, we found our safe spot. There's a safe spot in this tube where you won't pull anything, and G's will rest. So what we have to do here is that we spread up. We have two on each side, so if quaking comes, we won't die. We'll just quake each other, right? But we won't have two in stack of each other. We have these points, right? Get Fem up. Um, and what we do here is that we need to get all the roof craters on top of each other. Obviously, one of us having an interrupt each. So what we'll do is that we will do first interrupt, and then after that we will have to interrupt our heal later on. So we get them all stacked, we get the oil mob spawn, but we have six mobs that you potentially normally want to interrupt, right? All of these mobs are absolute blasters. We get them in, we use silence rune, and we start using all of our damage. Obviously we don't use lust, we don't have lust, we don't want to use lust here. So we use everything else, like all personals, all AoE. They come out of the silence rune and they have been a stun so after this stun you have to recast all of your defense intensives you see ams ice bomb fortitude all defensives on cooldown you don't die from these initial hits going through and what will happen is that directly after that cast it will cast a heal and obviously we each have a heal that we interrupt and then basically the mobs will fall over after the heal so we just kill them off here so one of them got a slight heal off that's why it still had a lot of hp got very very scary but we managed to pull it off uh, it dies. And here's the pride that we want to deal. What Fan does is Fan will stay back, make it easier for us to pass. We'll get up here and we'll rock past, basically. Melt and we just get over. Don't want to waste too much time here. Jeeth will have not have melted yet, but he will grip him over with life grip. Fem is in the back. He's tanking the mob, making it easier for us. We won't take damage. It won't be in a bad position. He gets gripped over. They melt together and we run to the next boss. So we basically just skip that prideful super easily. And we're on to the next boss, right? Skipping a super annoying prideful, you normally won't have a lot of buff for up on the boss. And have to waste a lot of time on, especially right after us using all of our defensives and or cooldowns, right? So, first boss, just a good old two people assigned to each crystal. Me and Fem on one crystal. And then we have Curry and Pekka on another crystal. Just getting the line on top of the boss, nothing too special. And then we had me and Fem... Uh, taking the squirrels on Milha not Milhouse, uh, Mini Mana Storm, which is the clickable bombs, not the squirrels, that she spawns. If you have a interact with mouse over macro, which we did, you're able to just keep spamming over the boss and you can interact with that bomb as soon as it spawns and you'll disarm it before it goes out of melee, basically. So melee deals with it, so range can keep casting, Jeeth can focus on healing, and then me and Finn will do it without too much of loss, right? If we get to mini real quick, you can see the bombs will spawn. And they get that one didn't actually get disarmed. I think this was a little bit of a troller one. Dun, 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 dun. You can see they get disarmed before they get on melee, right? So basically the idea was save Petco and Jeeth some time because Jeeth needs to heal is actually a pretty tight boss for Fem. It deals a lot of boss damage, right? And so me and Fem did that, and it didn't really like, we didn't lose anything. Sure, there's a cast time on actually disarming the bomb, but it's very minor. Nothing else to say about this boss. It's just a good old get the lines in between, thumb the bosses, uh, make sure that you don't make a crystal hit the boss. But that's, as mentioned, we assigned so that two people have one crystal each, and then you call for backup, right? So you always have one each. So it's like Fem me. Uh, Fem would very often suck hours if I didn't have cooldowns because he can just heal off the damage. And then Petko and Kuri would swap in between cooldowns to get the most out of the damage puff that you get from it as well. So the soak basically gives you a damage increase, but it also makes you take more damage, right? From the beam. And it keeps stacking pretty pretty fast. So that's basically how we dealt with it. So we just kill out melee. Nothing too special. Same as phase one, you know, you disarm the bombs, get the stun on top of her, and then we go further, right? And now we have the pull that we skip within these pods, which is the dog and the lady boys, right? With the spinners. Just wait for quaking. We know quaking usually always comes right after the stun there. We deal with quaking and we get all of the mobs in. Echo Frost Novas, all of the small bombs that explode and follow players. And then we just get everything in and we kill them at the same time basically. I die due to a stupid mistake of the robot just jumping on me basically. Just, just a silly mistake. Nothing to do about, well a lot to do about that. It should have happened. 
but it didn't, so it's just waiting for a rest. Uh, but yeah, I just died to the blade storm from the clients all jumping in my direction. Can you move your camera a bit? Oh yeah, of course. Wait, 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 wait. I didn't actually miss that. That's true. When there's small cam, good call. Put it over here. Uh, changing it to the other side. There we go. Okay. So yeah, we have these. We kill off the clients. I die due to the blade storm. It do be like that sometimes. Uh, we're just waiting a little bit. They're doing damage. Curry gets a rest off of me. Uh, actually, no, he doesn't get the rest off. Did he? He did. Okay, we kill off this pack. So our first rest is not really a problem. Our first combat rest, at least. And that pack is pretty easy to deal with, right? Like, we just die. And then we'll go ahead. Nothing interesting. What we do is that we get past these... The first... What's that called? The drill? Yeah, the drill, basically. Which you can skip on either of its side when it moves. So, if it moves... <laughs> I don't know where to put this, man. It's actually super annoying. Let's put it up here. So, depending on where they pull it, right? <clears throat> you can, uh, like, whether it's doing the thing, you can go either way, right? So, that's what we do. Wait for it, we go past. And here, we are gonna just get past these mobs with Mel. We're skipping these mobs up here. We don't want to deal with them yet. Again, due to pride timers. That's usually why skipping packs in uh, the other side is the way that it is. We just want to skip prideful. We kill off the enraged spirit, as mentioned, because you cannot skip the enraged spirit and it needs to die. I commit cooldowns to the enraged spirit and it basically just dies very, very quickly. Curry uses a little bit as well. Uh, so we'll have it back as soon as we get into the Arden War zone, like one minute is, which makes it pretty simple. Nothing to say, nothing, like a lot to say about it. It's basically just get rid of it. Don't have to deal with it in the future. And then we'll go into Arden World, which is probably the most annoying zone in bolstering. Um, which I'll touch a little bit on when we get there. But that's probably what we used most of our time to figure out how we're actually going to deal with this in bolster. So as you can see, Fen will just put down a silent rune, we'll run past, we'll use melt, and then we'll basically just get through the gauntlet. Not really anything super interesting about it. So let's see. Just quickly, let's get through the gauntlet here. Not really a lot you can do. Like, if you get bad positions, you just have to wait for the gauntlet. It do be like that, right? Like, you can't really skip it. Priest can grab you over, but a priest is very slow to get over in the first place. So that's usually not the play, right? Like, you'll just have to do. Fem, Petko, and Curry obviously being pretty fast. They just pull immediately. There's no reason to wait. So they just get all the mobs in. And now let's talk a little bit about why Ardenworld is such an annoying sword and bolster. So Ardenworld has a lot of different mobs, right? And all of these mobs have different HP. You have the rune stack with 300 plus, you have the shimmer moth with 250, and you have the smallest with 200. And obviously with bolstering, everything needs to die at the same time. So what we had done is that we had color schemed all of our plater pro like platers to, depending on the mobs that are in the pool, you'll know which one has the more HP, right? Basically what that means is that if an elder horn was in this pack, it would have, for me, for example, a purple nameplate. So I'll look out for that a bit more and shimmer moth had a bluish nameplate and the small ones just had a base nameplate for me so basically colors that made you easy to spot what mobs had what hp making you able to bolster it a lot easier how do you do that with plater there's an option called uh, npc coloring it is the nameplate add-on called plater i can show it uh, after we're done if you remind me i'll work through this so you can see all of the mobs die simultaneously really well at the same time uh we pull the next mobs which is double spricken and elder horn pack so in this pack you have the big elder horn and the ju ju juvenile stack horns that you need to deal with which have more hp than the other ones right so you basically just focus the elder horns a little bit just get rid of them you don't want to commit cooldowns on this because all of the small ones are so easy to deal with. I think Curry blasts them a bit, but outside of that, it's basically just some free epidemic spams and D&D skirt striking. Uh, obviously, DOS being the dungeon it is, I was playing full single target talents, right? Like, I was not playing AoE, I was not playing Bursting, I was not playing Claw. Uh, I was playing Unholy Blight and Army Redux and Shadow Claw. Shadow Claw, right? So... Yeah, that's basically the talent choices because there was no reason to go full AoE because a lot of it is not like big AoE and the single target damage is very much needed in tyrannical DOS, yeah, as you could see on her car. Very, very tight boss. So we basically kill off everything at the same time and then we're skipping this pride. 
we're leaving the pride up there so it's way easier to skip and we won't have to like deal with it or where we can kite fam has way more spots to kite we just get some hp fam's just gonna heal a bit because you hit pretty low when you play infected claw i'm in clawing shadows clawing shadows when you play single target ish builds in dungeons that's still aoe right and then you play infected claw on bursting spores builds depending on what dungeon so this is basically just half of the birds we initially tried to kill all the birds at the same time but for some reason we were not very good at controlling bolstering i'm not sure why uh but it was an issue i think the one of the big issues is that monk is target cap and might have offset some of the hp and depending on what mobs get critted by elysian was also some but all in all we just made it safe we split it up in two didn't want to take too much time doing it and it wasn't like too much of a time loss because uh we could just blast the pack and didn't have to worry about bolster too much so that was the thought we bring in the dragon we used the urn on this pack it was mostly just to not have the dragon cast its annoying fear ability all the time and we had to use the urn on something i didn't feel like the birds was needed when we split it up in two so here we basically use every single single target we use army etc etc just full single target the the, the dragon <clears throat> and then we'll kill off the smallies after right there's a lot of smallies in this area so area i think there's four still packed of smallies what we basically did is we take two of them in on the boss or on not on the boss on the sky talon and then we play the remaining two with another pack after so we kill off the dragon and you can see all those break-ins are getting low and just kill them off at the same time the same hp after all makes it a lot easier to actually deal with in bolstering but i can say this for sure if us won't become bolstering again you're going to see some insane pulls in Arden world you're going to see a lot of birds a lot of stealth mobs on top of each other and it's going to be insane numbers like without a doubt but sadly with bolstering that's not really doable so you have to play it safe so again here elder horn has slightly more hp than the oh what are they called the birds i can't remember their name the blade beaks so kill off echo would focus the rune stack and me and curry which is whatever which is aoe -ing. <clears throat> and when this pack dies we would get another pride so what we're going to do is that when they're about to die we're going to move them towards the other pride so the two prides are somewhat close to each other and it's going to be a way way easier to skip like it's just going to make it super easy to skip so we just skip that pride as well right and the reason for taking a little bit more towards the middle was so that again fem had more place to what's it called kite right well, actually this one spawned where we didn't want it to like it spawned pretty close to the other pole and what happens is that we actually some pretty jumbo shit fem pulls it away jesus waiting and he will grip faith uh grip fem in uh sadly the orb goes up on fem as you can see here which is a mistake fem gets hit they both wait and then they melt we drop combat fem is still alive it's not a problem we get the two remaining sprecken packs in and top of the shimmer moth and the other spriggan no the three remaining spriggans packs yeah so basically just deal with this pretty easy pull the shimmer moth has more hp than the spriggans so focus that a little bit but also that it's just aoe to go down again like just do aoe right pretty straightforward how do you get updates where the other team was while you were playing uh we wouldn't know like you could have it on the other monitor but it was uh like back in time right like it wasn't live if that makes sense there's some delay so i didn't look personally i was just full focusing on my gameplay making sure that i'm actually playing correctly right uh but yeah like you could watch but with a slight delay in theory but we didn't do that because we want to just focus on our own gameplay right don't want to look at the others we just want to 100 focus on our gameplay we can't really use that information to anything anyways so we're basically just playing the game as good as we can and here we're going to bring the remaining of the mobs down to all of the packs down here and that's going to be our last pull in other one this pool here just like the first pool has a lot of mobs with different hp you have the shimmer moth you have the blade beaks and you have the elder horns all of these mobs having different hp and the juvenile in the horn so it was basically just a swap constant yeah do aoe damage but keep swapping your main targets to cleave off them shimmer moth has slightly less hp than blade beaks but more hp than juveniles elder horn has most hp uh stuff like that right which made it super annoying these annoying pulls because you just have to keep swapping it's usually the blade beaks always ends up having a little bit more hp because they have the second highest hp but you have to focus the elder horn a little bit more but it's no problem we kill them off and that was the last piece like uh place in this zone 
And then we're going over to... I can't remember his name. Never can. The broker, right? A lot to do. We had a marker each. We would always go into the trap, which was the one that we spawned. So basically, you know, the traps that pull you up into the air where you have to go when there's bombs, they always spawn on where your character are. So we always knew where we stood. We tried to stand in a triangle, right? And then depending on where you stood, that will be your trap when you have to go up. And then we had a marker on each of us so we could decide, okay, let's say Curry soaks to Femme. So he goes to Femme, gives him the debuff. Faith he takes next, Femme goes to me, etc. right? That was the idea of it. <clears throat> so basically just made it way, way easier. We stand in a triangle and whoever had it would go to the, the closest to the tank, right? And then we would keep rotating it. See, we put markers if we end up having a bad one. So I'm going in on the left side, right? And we all get them anyways. If you just quickly go in, even though they're stacked on top of each other, you can just soak one of them if you just etch it completely. And the other one will still be close, even though they're practically stacked, right? So it's just don't jump in, just start or step into it. As you can see that I do uh, right here. Who takes him on the back and I start to step in. Fem still has his and we all get up, right? There's no problem there. But that's the thing that can happen. Just make sure that if that trap spawns, if you're on call with whoever you're playing, to say that you're taking the one closest to X or Y, uh, especially play a lot of melee. Obviously, it's a very ranged, heavy <laughs> Mythic Blast season, so it should be a problem if you play range, right? Not a lot to say, just killing the boss, speed it up a little bit. <clears throat> just dealing with it the old fashioned way. I actually do think, I'm not sure if this run, but one of us dies on dealer, uh, Sierra. I'm just gonna call him Broker, the dealer or whatever. Because I mistake Curry's clone for him, basically. And uh, then I get too close to Femme and I take the deep off when I shouldn't have. It might have been a practice run actually that happens. That was why the reason we took markers on each other to make it easier to control that. It was Pekka that died in. Pekka that died. I'm not too sure what he died to, doesn't matter. What happens here is that if you actually kill this boss, do not release. Uh, what you want to do is that you just stay dead until you exit the gauntlet. And what that will do is that you will spawn outside on the stairs instead of spawning where the boss just died. So just relax, chill. You can see Petco doesn't release. We wait, we get outside, we call you can release soon. And then he's going to spawn right on top of us and then we're ready, right? <clears throat> you can see Petco spawns. All good, he's here. And then we just go kill this pack that we skipped previously. Uh, and this pack will spawn a pride that we want to skip. So what we do is that we get all the mobs in, we kill them, and as they're about to die and the pride is about to spawn, we will go up the stairs and we'll spawn the pride up there, melt it, and then focus on the boss. That was the plan of this. We go up, as you can see, start dealing with the mobs up here. The pride will spawn very soon. Easy peasy. Actually, not sure if this is the run or it's the run against Obey that we actually mess it up and we have to kill it anyways. Might be this, let's see. We skip. We're still in combat. Yeah, so this was a mistake. So we just kill off the pride. Not really a lot to do, right? Like, stuff happens. I'm not sure what happened to get a pull, but I guess someone maybe didn't melt. So we just kill off the pride and then we'll use it on the first boss. Not that it does a lot Hello there. for it. So here. The thing about the first boss that a lot of people don't know is that you can force wherever he will go after you're done with totems, right? So as you saw, we didn't play the first pack in DOS, right? And you might think, hmm, but what if they're unlucky, right? But that's not the case. The boss will always go depending on where the tank stands. So if he stands on the far left, the boss will go to the far left and we'll deal with the boss on the far left. If we go on the far right, or the close right, and goes left right so if they go on right it will go to the right and we'll have to deal with the boss there so you basically force wherever he goes so two of our options here were do we want to kill that boss with the last boss um and force the mobs on top of the boss when he intermissions like the intermission is done which was originally a really really good play however it's bolstering and that allows us not being able to do that However, if you're doing a Mythic Plus and it's not like a high level, you could definitely look at it as a potential, right? Getting that pack in, like the first pack in later on top of the boss, could basically just be free count at some point if you have good AoE claim. 
So what we do, obviously, since we don't want that, is that we will force the boss to go left, making Fem take the portal upon left, and yeah, then the boss will go left, right? We have don't have to deal the pack that we initially first skipped. Outside of that, Mursala is pretty straightforward, you know. Use cooldowns and pull if you have one minute, and then you'll have them back for the totem. Uh, the totem you have to commit a lot of cooldowns to, because it's actually crazy how much damage like you have to deal to that mob. They have so much HP, especially in Tyrannical, right? Like, it's pretty, pretty wild. You see, Fem will go left, and that will make this boss always spawn on the left side. If you've gone right, it will spawn on the right side, right? So that was the idea of it. Nothing too special here, just pop cooldowns, kill off the totem, and, you know, the boss will pretty much just die, as long as you do a little bit of damage when you get over. Kill the totem, click. And you can see the boss will spawn here. Like, we knew the boss will spawn here. And then it's basically just go. And... Nothing too special about it. The boss has an immense amount of HP. So it still takes a long time to kill. Even after, you know, boss mechanic almost killing him, right? Like, you still have to take, like, 5-6% of his HP. And it just takes time. It just takes a lot of time. You don't have cooldowns when you get over. You have to commit the cooldowns to the totems. Because they simply just have so much HP. At least we have two execute classes, being the mage and the DK. You have Scorch, and I have my... Why can't I remember what that's called? Oh, it's... Yeah, my execute, which cannot be named right now. I can't remember what's called. So that's basically that boss, right? So we won the other side. I do think that what was called... Golden Guardians actually had one of the totems not die, which was what we wanted to not have, have happen, right? That's why we used everything on them. The Golden Guardians actually had one of the mobs staying alive, and yeah, we killed the boss, right? We didn't have to deal with a second intermission, basically. And now the Mist of Tiana comes, right? The dungeon... Uh, there's a lot of explaining on for the first boss, right? That uh, you might have seen happening where we abuse a mind control to basically just make the boss all oh, mega easy. And then another uh, thought that went through our mind that you can use potentially that we haven't didn't actually get to try out, but we're very sure that actually will work. That's going to be insanely powerful for high keys pushing basically if you have a priest basically what we do is that we kill off this pack here in the start again we want to make sure we have our pride at the right time we want to have pride at the first boss we deal off with these two villages they're pretty straightforward pull use everything here and they'll die not really anything interesting and then we will skip until the mushroom room we'll use our night off racials etc etc having fem go first don't want to get meleeed of course and we skip and we get over to the gate we open it up, we get our buff, and then we start doing the pull before the boss. So we bring in this pack here on top of the bow breakers. Nothing too extraordinary. It's basically just do some AoE damage, get some interrupts, uh, and then they would die, right? So we want to kill off this, all the small ones first, because then the pride will spawn with the bow breakers, and we can deal damage to the pride while the bow breakers are up. You can see the soul cleaver dies, and now the pride spawn. Then we still kill the bow breakers, but we get some cleave onto the pride. And let's basically do some free damage here. We sheep. That's something I should have mentioned before. So this entire idea of this pool that we were doing is that we have one of the soul cleavers CC'd in the back. We don't deal with it on this pool. So we only have one soul cleaver and two harvesters in. And we deal with this. Uh, as you can see, bow breaker is about to die. Pride is about to die. And then we have the soul cleaver come in. And now it's in the boss room, right? We poly it close to the boss or somewhat close to the boss and then we just kill off the pride nothing too special there and once the pride dies we go on the boss so the goal on this boss especially in tyrannical and in an mdi setting is that you want to face this boss immediately like this boss wants to get phased like, very quickly you don't only want one phase and our entire goal and how we made it was basically in a massive time shit savers that we found out that was by mistake actually which i'll explain after showing and so what we do so we go on the boss nothing too special obviously we're killing the tree uh we have our pride buff we're not committing cooldowns you can see we're not using cooldowns and when there's 45 seconds left we lost so you have 45 seconds of prideful you have 45 seconds of lost and when there's 25 we use our pot even though it's not ready like we're not past right we want to use the pot before we get feared we pot we pushed and then we use all of our cooldowns. So here comes the thing that I talked about. What we do is that Jeeth breaks the mob in the back. He mind controls it. And he gets the mob in. 
The Soul Cleaver has an ability, I'm not sure what it's called, let's just call it Soul Cleaver, which basically is a debuff that applies to a boss and or a player, you know, normally a player, but with mind control, it applies a debuff that makes the mobs take 20% increased damage. This 20% increased damage overlaps with the 300% increased damage that Ingra uh, has already, making it 360% increased damage on Ingra during his phase. So it's basically an extra 60% damage taken on the boss during his burn phase, right? Which is a lot of extra percent or free. So he gets that debuff and you can just see the boss absolutely melting. Curry hitting the 40k roof, I think, almost. And it dies. The second done with the damage phase, the mob is dead. So we bring this mob further down to the next pack. Or some free count, basically. We bring this down onto this. And that's basically how we deal with it. So and I, another theory we came up with doing this is that if you properly do this first boss with good CC, you can bring in two soul cleavers and you can mind control one of them use it on the boss dismiss it get it cc take the other mob mind control it use the ability again and it stacks so basically you can get this stack even further up and you can make the boss take a ludicrous amount of extra percentage of damage taken and you can basically just jump in between these cc and mind control control rotation and basically just kill the boss like insanely fast so just get two soul cleavers in. I think two is enough due to it having a cooldown, right? And you want to have CC2, CC them in between. So you're probably going to see people from now on having two soul cleavers in if there's no inspiring. Two soul cleavers in, they get double stack and the boss is just going to get obliterated. Uh, that will only happen if it's tyrannical though, is my guess. Because an 1845 should be pretty straightforward. And then you probably just bring one in. It's not worth the effort to bring in two. But definitely in tyrannical, we could definitely see the value of bringing into. So bring down the draft soldier. We deal with the pack. Um, very common trick is that you can pull the pack on the right through the wall when you get down here, so you don't only have to play two. We get the soul cleaver and we get the all up for the right, and then we just basically have this pull here. Nothing too, like interesting about this pull. Not an interesting mob. Not a lot to do with. It's just do damage basically. It was not anything we have to look out for. There's nothing we can do anyways due to inspire. So as you can see here, obviously they're not able to actually deal with the boss in one intermission. They get somewhat close, I think, but I'm not too sure. So they kill off Droman and then they start doing a lot of damage to Malog, right? I think they reach, yeah, like 20%. And then they'll have to swap back on the tree, I'm pretty sure. Oh, do they keep continuing? No, they can keep continuing. Yeah, they kill the, uh, the team that could actually continue. So they kill off Malog. Uh, but they have to do a lot of extra damage outside of the damaged burn phase and they waste a lot of time here. And you can see we're already now a second room. Uh, and the second room, what happens here in this pool is that there's an Inspire mob and there's two tenders. The two tenders are the heal mobs that you obviously want to interrupt. So what we do is that we CC the defender, we took out the tender, we interrupted them, put a silence rune and brought them in a defender and then we started leaving off of it, the defender. And the tenders would die before they started casting their second heal. So that was basically the idea, having as much uptime as possible in that pack. You don't want to just deal with it, right? You just want to go as fast as possible. That works out pretty well. You get a pride. You don't want to kill this pride. We melt it off and we go ahead to the next pack. Nothing too interesting about this pack. There's a shaper, a tender, get the interrupts. Nothing too interesting. We just have st stuff assigned. Get the mobs interrupted and then you just die for pretty easy mobs pretty straightforward what we do is that we um ordinate our cooldown so we had one person using cooldown per room so i just use cooldown in this room for example next room will be petco uh and then petco and jeeth i think is in this room yeah so you have convoke and combust and then the next room is i think that's just the chill room that we just get killed i think we might get a compost on it not too sure it was just a frog just deal with the frog nothing too interesting on in that boss basically just the tank jumps out skip the um <clears throat> lick and then that's about it that's the entire mob right it just has a lot of hp nothing too interesting 
So yeah, the Gosh Golem will die. We'll pull it up towards where Fem is because it will spawn a pride. So we all stack so we can skip this pride. Our melt is back from the previous pride, which is with the, yeah, the 20 pride, the 30, 40 pride. And then we skip that pride to get past. And then we kill the last pack before boss, which is pet curse cooldowns, uh, which is compost, of course. And then I will have cooldowns for the boss when we start the boss. Fill off the pack, go to boss. And first boss, or second boss, is pretty straightforward. There's not really anything interesting to do in MDI from what we know. It's just kill the boss, basically. Nothing super major. <clears throat> we have a lot of CC for the wool pins, though, due to our group setup. We have trap, we have root, etc, etc. So it was really easy to deal with the wool pins, not really scary at all. They did fix the fear bug on the wool pins, as where you could fear them as soon as they spawned, and they would become friendly. Or they wouldn't use their ability that has been fixed now so that doesn't work so just for notice if you didn't know that has been fixed can't do that anymore so yeah just start blasting the boss you can see i use cooldowns so i have cooldowns on the net like the next big pull after the boss basically that's the idea i want to have cooldowns back for that oh so slowly killing off the boss nothing too interesting let's see scroll a little bit no reason to see so what we do here is that we actually used Petco Slowfall, again, to save a little bit of time on mounting. So we Slowfall, uh, a lot of us, except for Fem, because it's a demon hunter, you don't care. You can see a slow falling past, first death mob, we don't have to deal with these mobs, don't really matter. We get down, I will CC this lava, Petco will CC another mob over on the right. Um, and then Curry will CC the inspired bird. And then we have a lot of mobs in. There's two interrupts each. I have red, etc. Get our interrupts and we just kill off the mobs. And as about the mobs are about to die, or at least the mobs that does cast, we'll bring in all of the inspired mobs. We'll deal with them on top of the pride as well. <coughs> so you can see they start dying. Echo will cancel his polymorph that starts walking from the other side. You can see it coming over there now. And then we have the pride with the three inspired mobs, which was pretty scary actually. And I think I died as well. It lived for quite a bit. But it do be like that. That's what we have the combat versus for. Still have the manifestation and the inspired mobs. Oh yeah, I got double reaper. That's what happened. I can rest by curry after they kill the pride. Just want to kill it off real quick. Instead of using cast for a rest. And then we have our rifle, which we'll use on the next two mobs that we'll bring to the last boss, basically with cooldowns. So we have these two packs. We will CC one of them. It's because we don't want to spawn a pride on the boss. So basically, there'll be one mobs that we leave behind and we'll CC, and we'll bring the rest mobs in, and we'll kill them on boss. And then eventually, the last mob will come in, and we'll kill it on top of the boss, and it will die. We'll proc pride for and we have all of our count. Nothing too interesting here. We use cooldowns, kill the mobs, super easy mobs, uh, the two packs before last boss. And as you can see, with 99%, the last mob is CC'd. It'll eventually come in. First boss is pretty straightforward. The only thing that is good to know is that due to it being inspired on the first pull, there's a lot of inspire mobs, it makes you unable to interrupt the boss. So what you do is that we used immunities on the first cast of Parasites. So we had Kree using Nelf, if it was on him, and then me and Petko using our immunity and just removing the bug completely out of existence. So we'll just let the cast go through, you know. He couldn't really stop it because it's uninterruptible. And we'll use our immunities to force that. And yeah, we just kill the boss. I think the mob should be coming in soon. Not too sure. I think it was around 20. I mean, it's already on the mob. So you can see the mob is on there. It'll just die to passive cleave. Boss dies, and the mobs dies, and we're done. A 70 with two deaths. Three deaths? One death. Okay, one death. And that, especially the first boss, was such a time gain. Um, and it's definitely going to be used by a lot of other people. <laughs> I know. Um, because it really does make up a difference in the first boss. You don't have to hold off the pride. You don't have to save the pride. Etc, etc. There's one game left, which is the game against Obey, which we sadly 
lost. So again, I think our first game is Plaguefall. As you saw in the first one, we didn't really have that much of a plan. It went a lot better, definitely, than the first run. But we only had like 30 minutes to practice it, and then we had then we started, right? We didn't have time. So it was pretty slow, we really no lever. We definitely got clapped on. Um especially because we had a full wipe third boss, which lost us like tremendous amount of time, right? So we lost that, we expected that to happen. But however, we did hope that we would win the other side, but we had a very annoying thing happen that made us lose it. So the other side is basically just as we saw before, like the pulls are the same as we did on the one before. Uh, there's nothing really changed uh, until we wipe, which basically ruins the run, which I'll explain when we get there. So let's get the same route, skip the first, kill the first, like the pack before the Sulker Rip Stone. Uh, Hard castle and whatever, and kill the enraged spirit, nothing changes. And then we'll move into the next area where we'll kill off the small twos and then bring everything right. Do that, nothing changed here. We do the same with Hakar, uh, use our cooldowns offset, making the boss actually take damage when it's needed to take damage. And we skip the pride, right? You can see Bay Alliance not skipping the pride because pride for Hakar is actually super helpful. Uh, if you can make the check or Etc. Etc. For the boss, right? It basically just makes it a lot more safe to have the pride for the boss. So nothing changes there. Let's get into the Mechagon zone where stuff starts to go wrong, basically. So you can see me and Pet go skipping, slow fall, any time matters, right? And again, here we'll deal with the two big mobs and then pull them in. Let's find the uh, Admiral zone. And the Admiral zone, the Mechagon zone. So here we are, where it all went wrong, where it all went downhill, boys. So as we see before, we're going to the Mechagon turn, we're using our stealth pot to get past the drillers, the dog, and the cleaners, I think they're called, the clients. So we get past this, make sure we don't hit each other with uh, waking, and we just W, right? Exact same as before, the only reason was that obviously Fem died before, but that won't normally happen, that doesn't happen here. So we get our mobs in, the exact same way, and here the super annoying thing happens. Fem's silence rune manages to hit the roof, basically, and it lands on top of where we are standing. Basically up here on a lamp, <laughs> which makes our entire CC rotation die. So as you can see, CC doesn't land, he gets a grip down, and we have to stun immediately out of the window right which is obviously not good the silence rune miss we use all our defense and we just try to live it we live the first heal it but we don't have our interrupts back for the heal so they get some free heal we do some other stops like stuns and grips to stop it try to recover by then you can see the lubricate is starting to blast and we just simply die to bolster lubricators and us losing this like missing this silence rune uh obviously it's not lot to do about a silent rune bucking through and landing on top of the roof right what little of fame could do about it i guess it do be like that sometimes it's just super annoying that it's a run that actually matters and obviously we full wipe because of it and we'll have to deal with the dogs um before we go through basically ruining our entire plan of skipping the way that we wanted to right we keep playing though but at this point our cooldowns are offset and we won't be able to do the pulls that we want to which basically makes it very, very, very difficult to recover. Like a pull like that, where you have to use an envy spot to commit to the skim, um, and you basically wipe it, it's basically uh, a game over, if that makes sense. But we, we keep going, uh, of course, because you might never know, right? Like they might make a mistake as well, like it could happen, right? But by then, you can see we're already far behind. We can't really recover. We're too far behind, and that's basically what we lose all of our time on. Having to take a full death, miss our potion, and having to play some mobs we didn't want to play before we can continue to play a mob solo that survived from the pool, right? That happens. You can see their entire zone ahead. Sadly, we're dealing with the enraged spirit by the time they're already done with the first pack in Ardenveld. And that's basically just going to cause the inevitable uh, loss, right? 
you can see we still on third boss they're moving on to Mogonzala and by then it was too late there was not a lot to do to recover and we sadly lost that game uh <laughs> due to having that full wipe that just basically ruined all of our cooldowns and offset them but it, it it was still like we tried to recover as well as we could but Bay Alliance obviously had it down um and they weren't able to deal with us like they beat us right so again Mogonzala by the time that we're still dealing with the pack in front of him I'm pretty sure yeah and that was it sadly as the next game if we had won this would have been missed which we were pretty confident in obviously so I wish a shame that we lost the other side due to that but it do be like that sometimes it do be like that a good game from Obey sadly we uh <laughs> didn't win it and obviously we got pushed out at a what was it I think sixth place sadly due to this loss so it do be like that it do be like that but we're still super happy with our game against Golden Guardians and our Horse of Atonement against Echo which we were very happy about the outcome of even though we didn't win the game in Horse of Atonement we played as good as we could and we were proud of how close the game came even though we didn't play Night Elf and with that that was basically the run through of all of our MBI stuff looking through that so I hope it gave a little bit of an idea of the mindset that you have going into a dungeon the reasoning behind pulling stuff and not pulling stuff <clears throat> how we find stuff why we did x and y and uh, yeah i hope uh, it was a little bit helpful to get into the mindset of what actually goes through like doing all of this kind of stuff obviously we had the mind control stuff in mist of tiana which uh, was a game changer as i said it was basically spurfing xd which we found by a pretty funny mistake actually so uh fem had to go smoke right after we were in front of the first boss we were trying to find out a way and we one face this boss basically <clears throat> and what happened was that echo went fk as well and it was just me and jeet and jeet mind controlled the soul cleaver that we had just cc'd as the poly ran out and he moved it to the boss and he saw that the mob obviously had his ability soul cleaver and he used that ability and it worked on the boss and then we were like oh shit dude we could amplify this on the damage taken on the damage phase and it overlapped and it was insane and we one faced the boss every single time after we tried that basically just changed the entire way the boss was played obviously it would have been nicer to win the second game against obey but they blasted us and we were unable to pull it off right like we couldn't win it and it do be like that it'd be like that sometimes